I want to tell you the story of our connecting flight from Philadelphia, uh, through Philadelphia from C uh, Seattle. I believe that Gene and I had a, uh, a connection that we'll remember the rest of our lives. And I thought it relates a lot to what we're about here. Um, when we got our tickets at the check-in in Seattle, they forgot to give us the, the, the boarding pass of the second leg for Gene. It just didn't wasn't in there. So I'm on the plane, we're on the plane, uh, the first leg, and I said, is there going to be any problem when we get to Philadelphia to get Gene's boarding pass? And they said, no, no, it shouldn't be a problem. So when we got to Philadelphia, and it's our first trip to Manchester, we have flying to Manchester, we, uh, there was announcing on the radios, we're coming out, we're late, see, we're late, the plane arrives about a half hour late, we have an hour connection, and the announcements are, Manchester flight uh, A30, and uh, we're leaving right now, you've got to get, you got to get going. So I get out to the board, and I look at the board, A30, okay, and I said, how am I going to get, I ask the first person near me, who's a guy sitting in a cart, how do I get to A30? And he says, hop on, we've got two seats left, everybody's going to Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> so off we go, and you get wind in your face, you know, it's going really fast. And it's it ringing, ringing the bell, and I later found out it's over a mile. Over and it's like the other end of the world. <laughs> and we finally get there, and we jump off the thing, and off the cart, and rush up to the counter to see if we can't get a boarding pass for Gene. And the guy says, where's your passport? He says, uh, I just have my driver's license. He said, I mean, sorry, we need your passport. I was thinking, you know, George Bush, what's going on? Uh, so, but... But um, it turns out that this is Manchester, England they're talking about. They need a passport. <laughs> and we flagged on another one of those cruisers, and we're flying. I'm, I'm explaining to the guy, we've got to get all the way to the C-20. So we're flying back down this long thing, trying to get there. And now it turns out that the C section and the A section, where these are, there's a part where the where the cart lets you off, and then you have to run and scramble, and it's actually kind of confusing where it is. So the guy lets us off, and we're hoping there's another cart at the other end, but there wasn't. So we start running one way and another, get a little confused, and we, we go down this one corridor just a little bit, and then we thought, no, this isn't it, and we turn back, and the guy says, I'm sorry, you've crossed this point. You can't go back. <laughs> uh, uh, now, we have crossed out of the secure area without a boarding pass to get in. <laughs> so we're, our, we've got these wheelie things. We took our luggage with us. We've got these wheelie things flying around, and we're racing to the counter and begging people to get to let us in, and there's like six minutes to go, and we're just hoping the counter will be available. And lo and, and we we rush through, get a boarding pass, rush through the security, we rush to the front of the line, it's unfortunately it wasn't crowded, and then Gene is running, we both got sweat pouring off our faces, <laughs> and we the guy scolds us when we get there, because it's only just a, like two, three aisles away, or what do you call it, the jetways away, and we, it was so easy. And the first person, first person we see when we go in there is Abigail, who's on the same connecting flight. <laughs> and she's wondering why we're so late. <laughs> but we made it. So. But I, I, I'm, a part of this is like, this is how we do these problems. This is how it works, is we create the problems, and then we try and solve them. You know, I mean, if we just had a moment of mindfulness, we, we, could, we could have made the plane no sweat, it would have been luxurious like probably Abigail had, but, but because we're making the problem 
through our mindlessness, and then we've created systems of distrust where we have to work our way through these systems of distrust that we're trying to do. And that to me is, like, I believe the solution to the environmental crisis, to all our crises, is gonna be that simple. It's gonna be that simple when we, we flip that switch so that we can all be mindful together. Um, this, this is the crucial question. To solve the environmental crisis, we need to blank. My guess is every single person here has something to say about filling in the blanks. And there's all kinds of possibilities, and I've got lots of them too. And the question isn't, we don't know what to do. We know what to do. The question is, I mean, there's, these are some of them. Just wake up and get out of denial, implement your policies. I can't read them all, speak to the power. Um, uh, build the political will. I mean, when I saw that inconvenient truth, it seemed to me so many of the, I mean, it really boils down to building political power, building political will, supporting new technologies. There's lots of, lots of new technologies that are available out there. So we, we know what to do. The issue is, there's no we to do it. If there was a we, we wouldn't have these problems to begin with. If there was a we, you're, not, you're just not going to have racism. You're not going to have war. You're not going to have terrorism. You're not going to have environmental ignorance. If there was a, a cognizant, thoughtful we, we could take all, all kinds of these problems just start going away. Uh, so who's the we? Who, who are we talking about? And it's really important to distinguish between the different kinds of we that we're talking about. One of the ways is we as individuals. You'll hear often, we need to wake up. We need to get out of denial. We need to take conscious action. We need to reduce our carbon footprint. So there's all kinds of things about dealing with the individual we. All of us as individuals and the actions we take as individuals. So we got that. I mean, we, we know how to do that. And then there's the we with others, the we, the political we. If just a few of us, if, I mean, if a number of us can get together and pull the levers of political power, and we fight, do battle for legislation, whatever, I mean, that's how we got into the war in Iraq. A few people knew how to pull those levers, and lo and behold, we are attacked Iraq. It's a, it really wasn't us, but, but it seems like it was us because somebody figured out how to pull those levers, and now we collectively did that. So, if, uh, so that's the second kind of way. It's, uh, we, we politically, we with others. The third kind of we is, is we as a culture. Somehow if all of us, not just some of us, not if us individually, but if all of us can somehow together become aware and kind of build a, a uh, critical mass so that CEOs and purchasers and stockholders and customers and, and employees and all of us kind of have the same sense of awareness and working with the environment, then uh, we can make a substantial difference. And we know how to do that. There, I mean, we, there's people, let me just put it this way, there are people working on these. To me, if we do all three of those, we haven't done enough. It's not possible. Because our system is structured, our system is structured to have a special interest competition, economically, politically, that's the way it works. When your son or grandchild, in some cases, <laughs> or that's what I'm thinking, uh, graduates from high school or college, he 
can't just serve life and, and earn a living. Can't, can't just serve the general will and earn a living. We, as our society, we say, oh, no, no, that's not going to work. You have to go serve this special interest. And then you can have a nice lifestyle. And then there's, our society will support you. So structurally, we need something else. There needs to be something else. And what we're the essential piece is we, the people, some way that all of us can be thinking and talking in one conversation, can be acting thoughtfully, and making collective decisions that work. If we can do that, if we can set that piece in, in motion, then it affects all the other levels. If there really is a we the people, if it was possible to have a we the people, and I believe it's possible, and I believe it's possible in the short term, I believe it's there are social inventions that make this not only possible, but inevitable. It has to happen. There has to be a we where we say, hey, is our system working? Is this okay with us? Do we want to make subtle, subtle, some changes, some adjustments here? And the key part of this, well, let me just say what the we the people is. We the people is all of us. It's inclusive. And it's all of us being thoughtful and wise collectively. And it's all of us reaching unanimous conclusions. We're talking about 260 million people or whatever, reaching unanimous conclusions. Now when I say that, there's two ways to get unanimity. Two kinds of unanimity. One kind of unanimity. Unanimity means one mind. There's one kind of unanimity is where you and I have a different opinion, so we have to mute our differences somehow. I have to mute my individuality, and then we can maybe come together into some kind of compromise or consensus or something like that. The other way to get unity is when you and I have different views, and we are talking in such a way that we have a creative breakthrough. Now, all of a sudden, we have an idea or a solution strategy that's better than either of us thought was possible. And in fact, it requires me to be unique and it requires you to be unique and even more unique. So one kind of unanimity mutes the differences. The other kind of unanimity enhances the differences and uniquenesses. Most meetings eliminate this possibility. Normal meetings eliminate that. Oh, I, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So okay, so we're, if we establish this we the people, transform, it, tr it would transform us and our system. In other words, if we're part of a collective that can can be uh, making wise choices together, and be in this conversation, this special kind of conversation that's a creative conversation, if that were possible, we would be different. We would be making different individual choices. We would be in relationship to one another. And into the to the universe, into the to life itself. So the, the one system is where the system's in charge and we serve the system. And that's that's what we've got right now. The system is on automatic pilot. I suspect how many here would, are in favor of us collectively trashing the planet? <laughs> We're unanimous. I think we can ask everybody. Everybody's already in favor of crashing the planet, and yet collectively we're doing it. What a curious thing. Why? Because there's no way to figure this out and to make strategic adjustments. So we're, the system is on automatic pilot. We serve the system. Citizen involvement, actions like that, merely involve us in the system as it is. To create a we the people is to put, this, put we the people in charge. And then we create a system around us that serves us, serves the, the people. Now, I, know, I know this is still theoretical part, but so let me just say, I, I think there's an, an innovation that can do this. And actually it will spark this, that, because there's lots of other innovations around that are ready to serve, to, to work with us. And the innovation is this Wisdom Council concept. And let me just say, um, because part of what we're doing at the conference is an experiment with the Wisdom Council. It's still theoretical. 
but we've done maybe 20 experiments, and everything so far says, hey, this is going to work. And what I'm hoping you will do is say, I'd like to participate in this, this experiment here at the conference. And uh, not only for myself, because it's fun, but also because uh, to sh demonstrate how a large system can make have a, one conversation and become uh, we the people. Maybe we won't do that here, but we'll at least point to how that can happen. So okay, so so this would be a, a fun dialogue with your colleagues. This would be where you're the you know rather than going to a session where somebody else is a leader, this is where you're the leader of the session, and uh, everybody that is there. Is we're exploring the issue of whole system change. We're learning a new form of dialogue, because it's not dialogue. It's something we call choice creating. And it's about making collective progress, possibly, on, on, uh, on I mean, the topics that you address, I suspect, will be on the environment. And I suspect <coughs> it's possible to make real progress, real, real actions come out the end. And then uh, to help evolve this, this social breakthrough. So, how does the Wisdom Council do it? And what's, what's the core? One core is that we randomly select people from a system. So if the system was the state of New Hampshire, we would randomly select, say, 12 people. And they meet for like three days. And they choose the issues of what to tell you. They, we essentially say, you are we the people of New Hampshire. And you meet for three days, and so what are the issues you want to address? What are the issues that are important to you? And the facilitator helps them come up with the issues that really matter and that may seem impossible to solve. And they work on them for three days, and what we found in our experience is every time people finish with a unanimous perspective, and they finish with a story about how they got to that unanimity, and they finish with the feeling of, yes, we can do this, and this is fun, and we like these other people, even though they're totally different. And I think we've had maybe, I mean, almost in every time we've ever done a wisdom council, at least two or three people say, if you ever get selected, do it. So that's been our experience. We haven't created a way the people officially yet in a community, but we've done lots of, we've done a lot in the other, the other ways, and we, everything that we've done so far points to the fact that we the people is possible. So the point of the Wisdom Council, these 12, when they meet and they present, the point of it is not, they're done, that's it. They speak to the larger community. The point is to create a whole system conversation where everybody's now talking. Everybody has a focus. Letters to the editor, surveys, uh, dialogue networks, dialogue groups. The point is to create a whole system conversation that's creative and that's working on the real issues. Finally, when we're all part of it, we're all facing the big issues. Like the other. And then you randomly select the new group in four months or so. And this new group is in, has learned from this previous conversation, and they meet, and they choose issues, and they take it another step further. The idea is to spawn a whole system conversation with all of us apart. And the core of this is this special quality of thinking, that it isn't dialogue. It's nice that we always talk about, gee, great, we get everybody together and we dialogue. That's a nice sounding word, and dialogue is really powerful. But one of the problems with dialogue is it doesn't come up with answers. There's no group answers that come up with dialogue. I feel inspired, I feel connected to the universe, I feel transformed, but it's not like we're a group, we're coming up with answers. So, so it's an ongoing process, and, and it's a, a strategy to involve everybody in one conversation about the issues that matter, reaching wise, shared conclusions. Uh, the quality of thinking 
that is essential, I think, if we're going to become sustainable is simple. It's where everyone comes together respectfully and addresses the big issues, the issues that really matter in a spirit of heartfelt creativity where we seek solutions that work for everybody. That's a really simple thing. All of us coming together and being creative together and trying to figure out what's really the answer. That quality of thinking, uh, what do you call it? Well, a dialogue doesn't work. Discussion doesn't work. It's not a discussion. It's not really problem solving. That has its own definition. Consensus building has a different meaning. So that quality of thinking that is the key, in my judgment, the most important quality of thinking if we're going to build this we the people, it doesn't have a name. So what we've done is give it a name. We call it choice creating as opposed to decision making. Probably nobody likes that when they first hear it, but later you might get used to it. <laughs> uh, and the difference is in, in decision making, you're using your judging mind. You're saying, okay, we've got this option and this option. Which one is best? And we weigh them, we use criteria, and we're judging. In choice creating, we're stewing in this heartfelt, creative way, and then answers pop out that everybody co-senses to be the same. We call it co-sensing, not consensus. And we call these not decisions, we call them of courses. <laughs> We look at it one another and we say, well, of course that's what we're going to do. It's a different process of thinking. But it's the process of thinking that we do all the time. It's just it doesn't have a name. We're not pointing to it. We're not working at it. So, uh, and, and normal meetings, in order to bring, normal meetings get, if you just turn people loose, things sort of fall apart. So in, in the meeting process. So okay, you have a facilitator and you traditional facilitator will you will aim at what's possible, for instance. You don't want to work on something impossible to solve because you can't do anything about it. How many here believe creativity exists? <laughs> okay, I think that's everybody. Okay, so let me give you a hypothesis. It seems to me if creativity, creativity exists, we want to use it on the impossible to solve problems. That makes sense? So if we have an impossible to solve problem, we ought to be using creativity. Not, hey, we gotta get more serious. You know? That's just not the thing. <laughs> not gonna do it. We got an Israeli-Palestinian crisis. Okay. When do we do the creativity part? You know, when do we bring that in? That's the key. How do you bring that heartfelt creativity to that spirit, to that conversation? So, okay, so, so but normal meetings, we, we've learned how to push that heartfelt creativity away. And I think I know why. But the, I mean, we aim instead to logic. We say, oh, don't get passionate about that. Yes, get, more, get, get rid of your passion. Be more logical, precise, consistent. Don't be passionate. And uh, we're going to evaluate the ideas. We're going to use criteria that we all accept ahead of time. And uh, we, we don't want any surprises. We want to follow the agenda. And all our understandings are going to happen through cause and effect, rather than through systemic, rather than through emergence, for instance. So I'm just pointing to a different quality of thinking and the fact that our normal meetings mute that quality of thinking. So. The quality of thinking. I, I didn't. I didn't un understand this quality of thinking. I, what I did uh, about 20 years ago was create a process of facilitating meetings that seemed to work. That seemed to bring people together in the spirit, of, even though they were angry at one another, or even though they were uh, working on something that seemed impossible to solve. I developed a way of facilitating called dynamic facilitation, where people just start working and figuring out what's, what the real problem is, and they start uh,
being listening to one another and being creative together and having breakthroughs. Maybe not a breakthrough all the way, but they have start having shifts. And it's fun to be in a group like that. It's fun to have shifts on an impossible to solve problem. It's fun to feel that sense of empowerment, like, my goodness, we can do something about this. I, I just had no idea we could do anything about this. <laughs> And what happened to me in the seminars is I would say, okay, um, if it's possible to take creativity and impossible problems and put them together, let's work as a way of practicing on issues you care about. So people would go into different corners of the room, practice facilitating, and they would take the education system, and they would take health care, and they would take the environment, and they would take inner city crime, or they would take welfare system, or whatever. they take all these different problems. And they would work on it this creative way, and they would have breakthroughs. And what they would discover, what often happened, is that the breakthrough would be the same, no matter what <coughs> problem the group was working on. Anybody want to guess what the breakthrough is? Unilateral. Communal action. Communal action. Communal action. Yeah. Well, that, uh, you're jumping ahead, but yes, it would get to that. That's right. Uh, basically, the breakthrough would often be that these problems are not caused by people. They're not caused by bad people. Mm. They're caused by the system. They're a natural outcome of our system. Just you take that system, you plug people in, you're going to get these problems. So then the question is, well, how do we change the system? How, what, what does it mean? How do we get in charge of the system? And that's where we're back to the communal action. Is if there is this we the people, then all of a sudden we're in charge of the system and we can design our systems to be, to be what, what they need to be. So for instance, can you imagine an organization that you're a part of that has a 200-year-old system <laughs> that you bow to and you claim it's the best there is and so it's not worth looking at anymore? And you profess loyalty to it? It's okay. It's a great system. And in fact, that it's not that isn't that's the structure maybe. But there isn't anything necessarily wrong with it. It's just that it's, there's no we on top of it. There's no we the people. There's no us. We're not in it. I mean, we're, we're, we're subjects of it rather than in charge of it. And that's the distinction that if we could be in charge of our own system, that opens doors to, to just having lots of these issues just go away. So what I created in this dynamic facilitation is a way to almost assure that choice creating quality of thinking in a small group. And the way, it's, the way it works, basically, some of the core people are, is that people just talk. We don't need to train them ahead of time. But whatever they say, the facilitator shapes it so that it's a contribution to the group. So if the person wants to get angry at somebody and say, no, that's a lousy idea, you say, oh, time out, you have a concern. Let me write that down on our list of concerns. Now, did you have an idea, a solution behind that concern, maybe, that we could put up on the list of solutions? And, and we protect them. We protect everybody. So no matter what bubbles up, no matter what comes up, it's a contribution to the group. And so we're always building moving forward, we're always looking at the problem together. Everybody's in an in alignment working together on problems. And rather than the back and forth argument, so we don't ever even hear the words disagree, and we don't hear the word agree, because we're not thinking that way. And we didn't train anybody to do this, we just facilitated was assuring that in the room. And then a key, what we're after is shifts, and breakthroughs, kind of movements where you see the energy jump. And what happens is people have actions come out and they have the spirit of we and the sense of we the people. 
how. How do you take that small process? How do you take that, what happens in, we can guarantee in a small group, and how do we have that happen for a big system? Like, we the people of the United States? Are we the people of the world? Is it possible to do that? Well, I think that this different, as long as we make the distinction of what kind of thinking we're talking about, and we target that kind of thinking, and then we use a process like the Wisdom Council, which uses a randomly selected group. So, so the Wisdom Council process uses like randomly, I guess I lost that chart, but uh, so you have where you basically take this randomly selected group, so you have a microcosm of the large system. And that microcosm then is uh, they're a legitimate symbol of we the people because they choose the issue, they're a microcosm, and they reach conclusions. And then they express those conclusions back to the system and then we all talk. And they're gone. There isn't any, there isn't any power or authority. We are the power. So for instance, if, you, if there's one person here who disagrees mightily, maybe because you have some new information that the Wisdom Council didn't have, like you're the expert in this field. Now the cameras or the movie camera or the TV cameras rush over to, to find out what you think because you are the expert. So the conversation isn't, the Wisdom Council just facilitates that conversation. We don't need to get experts in that group. The experts are in all of us. So it's really about having an expert conversation, but the expertise of all of us is part of it. And over time, we just have a new way to, to have statements drop out over time of what we're all talking about. So I'll go one more. This is the, so the Wisdom Council is a little bit different than other ways of involving citizens. And what we're after is uh, one conversation rather than a network of conversations. We want, also want the network of conversations. But, but we're really after one conversation that involves everybody. And the quality of the conversation, we want to do whatever we can to assure that it's choice creating and not some of these other qualities. That it's heartfelt, creative, collaborative, and it's meaningful. So we're dealing with what matters. And then the outcomes, one of the outcomes is the spirit of we, the we the people. Plus, there's lots of results that come out. There's new policy, new wise choices, collective and individual actions, and so forth. So in Victoria, British Columbia, I thought I'd tell you a little about a couple of our experiments. This is the uh, first Wisdom Council they did in Victoria. There are 20 people in the convening committee in Victoria who have now done two cycles of the Wisdom Council in the city of Victoria. <clears throat> and uh, out of that, I mean, it's, we're still experimenting. This is still experimental. And it's not like they have any money. We haven't done this with money yet. <laughs> 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 haven't done any money, but nothing with money yet. So they're all volunteers and they, they're, um, but this was the first group and they, uh, we had a kid sneak in, a kid over there, the third from the left, uh, it's only 17, he was supposed to be 18. But he, he managed to get in, and he was the star. Uh -huh. <laughs> it rings in his all ears and whatever. But uh, uh, one of the things that happened that I thought was pretty neat out of this is somebody in the audience heard the Wisdom Council, and he got so excited, he printed up a bunch of cards. They were talking about the homeless uh, people on the streets, and he printed up a bunch of cards. There's somebody in the audience, and uh, that he went and would tell the, I mean, the cards would say where the where you could get help, where you get food, where you get lodging for cheap, and he would hand those cards out to people, and he handed them out to the store owners to be able to give to the people when they were there. And this was just somebody in the audience who got who got inspired. Um, this is a group of students at the Port Townsend High School, and they are a class of. 
an alternative class. This is the alternative uh, class of, actually it's Port Townsend and two, two high schools. And they are the conveners of a wisdom council for the town of Port Townsend, for the voters of the town. So when the, so when the voters were randomly selected and they finished their talk to the audience, then everybody broke into small groups to talk about what they came in, but, but they had the audience, the hall was full of youth and adults. And so it was, it was very exciting that the youth uh, were, couldn't believe they were stars. All the adults wanted to talk to the youth. And uh, I mean, these are kids that you know, pretty much aren't making it in the high school system. And so that's why they're in the alternative class a lot of times. And these kids were so empowered in this process. This was the, one of the first experiments we did in the Rogue Valley. And there's a video on the web that you can see, a 22 minute video of this. Um, there's a guy named Joseph McCormick, who uh, was a former Republican candidate for Congress in Georgia. And he was really discouraged after losing the election. Uh, and he kind of went on a hiatus and he read my book and called me and uh, came out and filmed this, which was just a boom to our lives. So Joseph filmed, uh, it, was, it was again a bunch of, it was three people who heard me give a radio interview and those three people convened the Wisdom Council, one version, just one, it wasn't ongoing, in uh, the Rogue Valley. But Joseph filmed it and there's a 22 minute video on uh, Democracy in America that you can see on the web. But um, what has happened since is that the audience was so inspired that we the people could exist that they have gone on to create a website and begin the process of changing the town charter. So they have a, um, as I understand it, they're very close to changing the, the town charter because they realize that they don't even need to go to the city council to do that. They can just get the town charter uh, to be changed through a town vote. In Wolford, Austria, someone who went to our seminar in Frankfurt um, uh, happens to work for the Austrian Office of the Future. <laughs> nice job. <laughs> so, so he said this was cool, and he set up a. He found a mayor that wanted to sponsor it in Wolford, Austria. And so they uh, began a wisdom council there. And um, I don't know if somebody was in the audience or what, but it won a national prize, $5,000, for um, uh, sustaining the environment, because they chose the environmental topics. In uh, the Department of Agriculture of Washington State had one for, uh, I hope they still have one. They have new leadership now, and we're, we're not seeing much action but they, uh, they had a cycle, and it really is about creating a culture of safety. It was one of the th emergent uh, things that happened out of the Department of Agriculture. And uh, so, it can, so it can happen within an agency, within a government agency. And the way that started was actually, they got started on one side of the mountain. Washington State has, you know, the mountains down the middle. So they had, it started in, in one office building, and they decided to enlarge it to the whole west side, and then they um, made it statewide eventually. And uh, this was all bubbling up from, from the employees themselves that started this. So, um, and they did it statewide, and it, 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 there were some embarrassing moments for management, but it was really at times just because um, they identified some issues that hadn't really been thought of before and weren't were taken care of, uh, and boy, were they taken care of. And the management that were sponsoring this then really became the heroes in the end because they had sponsored a way to solve these problems. One more, uh, Sam, this is Salmon Bay Elementary School Wisdom Council. This is one among the faculty, the administrators, and the parents of an elementary school. And they did three versions with no faculty participating the first year. And uh, then they stopped 
and then they went a year, and at the end of that next year, the um, some one of the parents was noticing that all the change that had happened had happened out of the wisdom council. So she wrote a letter to everybody uh, saying, notice all these changes we made, let's celebrate that, but notice also they came out of the wisdom council, so we need to get that going again. And so they did, they started, this year they're starting up the wisdom council again. So here's, uh, let me just tell you what the conference experiment is. Um, I've given up on randomly selecting. I think what we'll do is just, you know, compromise again. <laughs> but, uh, but what we'll do is whoever can and wants to be a part of the Wisdom Council process on uh, today or tomorrow will come to the um, lobby of the hotel, yeah. to the inn over there uh, at 10. And now what we need is we need a container to hold everybody, so it's not a deal to come in and out of. But we can stop when the whole group wants to, or if they feel completed with, or, or and, but the idea is to have a good enough piece of time where you can tack, take a real issue and work it through. And the issues can be um, the environmental challenge or what this group could do, or I just don't know. But you can you could pick that. And the, of course the goal would be somehow to involve the whole community that's here. And so this group will have an opportunity tomorrow morning, thank you to Lily, uh, to present. They'll have a half hour. So the group will meet. I, what we're planning on is two sessions, the, the, from 10 to essentially the morning session and the afternoon session. And then tomorrow they will present their unanimous results and conclusions as the keynote. So you will be the keynote uh, tomorrow morning. And, uh, and then we'll have one more cycle of that. So hopefully we will be able to see progress happen between the sessions and hopefully that will be inspired. And then on Saturday morning, I'm hoping you'll all still be here and uh, we'll be able to participate in some closure of that with, with Lily and maybe even having actions that move forward. So, uh, so the cycle will happen twice and the idea is to demonstrate how a, how a large system could have one conversation and and yet not take all the energy and uh, and then have the results be meaningful. So that's that's the aim. And you're part of, I mean, this is an experiment. We haven't done this before. We played with the edges a little bit. But, so it's an idea. Yes? Different people for two days? Or yes, different people. Different people. Yeah. So if you come the first day, you don't come the second. Or if you, you know, so thank you. Um, other other questions? This is, I think that's my last slide anyway. Uh, well, yeah, well, I'm just going to say that, so if you don't come or if you do come, we invite you to learn more about the process and just hold this, hold this image. Because this, I mean, as you do your other work, your heroic work, really, your heroic work, because uh, you're on the edge. You're the ones that are holding this burden for so many of us. And, uh, and it, but as you do it, just hold on to this possibility that this could be real. And to maybe learn more about it. It's just, I mean, it's, it's I, I, if you can, I, I think people have a hope ceiling. You know, they see their hopes starting to rise, and if they get too high, they go, oh, no, I can't go there. <laughs> because I've been disappointed before. So play with that. And, and But I think, you know, there's a, there are people that look to me and say, I'm getting too hopeful, I don't want to do this. You know, I'm going <laughs> to So, um, so, okay, so. And, and obviously, this is a, a beginning process. It's still early, and it would be nice to have other experiments. So maybe one in your community or your organization or something, and maybe we can support you in some way, or your church, whatever. Yes? How does a system like this work in the midst of a system that's resistant to change? Like, take, uh, for example, if you possibly live in a community like I do, which is mostly white, very politically conservative, I'm one of the few progressive people in the community. How would someone like me convene something like this when all the people who have the power are resistant? Yeah. Well, that's what we did at Port Townsend, actually. We used the high school students. Um, the, the, the neat thing about this is we don't need, you don't need to sell a lot of people. What you need is to get a couple of people around you to get it and they can be supportive. And it's nice to have some resources. 
And it's nice also to get some early support from the media, you know, maybe as possible co-sponsors of this town dialogue. Also nice to get, um, if you could get the city council to endorse it, or maybe even suggest a topic. Not that you go there, the group picks the topic. But, um, but what we did in, we, in the, the Rogue Valley, for instance, we had three people. Those three people convened the Wisdom Council, the first version. See, because if you randomly select people, and you're honest and ruthless about that randomness, if they, you randomly get those 10 people, and you're stuck with some self-selection, but, you, but you're, in your heart you're trying to do it randomly. You get those random people, and they choose the topic, and they reach a conclusion, that is a legitimate symbol of we the people. And you did it, just you and your two friends. And it's actually an end run around the system. Because if people start to buy in and go, yeah, I think so too, and you actually people draw in the community, then we already have the vote, we already have all these things that we need, all of us. We can start saying, this is the topic we'd like the city council to address. This is the topic we we would like to, and there was a, there's a there's a power shift that's possible in this. So that's, it's an end run strategy. So that's how, and, and see, uh, to do this for the United States, for instance, we don't need. I, I, when I wrote my book, I thought we needed it to be a constitutional amendment, and it should be. But you know, if we get enough monetary support and media support, we can just do it. just now, but you also had mentioned it in the course of your talk about uh, somebody disagreeing and the media then playing a role. It, it seems to me uh, that the media have a very vested interest in the public mythology, in the, in the dominant in the empire mythology that, uh, mythology, the empire frame of mind of white folks uh, that was so ably discussed last night. Uh, uh, if you get to some of the uh, nitty gritty issues the war on terrorism. Uh, uh, how do you get from a random sample uh, uh, that has been <coughs> totally miseducated by the media? Uh, how do you get anywhere that gives a fundamental challenge to the uh, accepted point of view of the assets. Well, the, the the question is, how do you get a view coming out of the Wisdom Council that could challenge the accepted doc, uh, orthodoxy? And I just need to tell you, it happens. In other words, <clears throat> what, um, what the process of thinking breaks down the walls of we, we all live in a fortress of denial. We're all pretending that it's okay to just keep driving the cars, and it's okay to, to, that, I, that I, I'm, I'm working in this job that pays me money, but I really don't have squelched my own passion in life, so I'm doing it. Uh, I'm pretending that I, I'm pretending to myself that, I'm, that that's what I want to be doing. And it's, it's like, there's just denial all around. And what happens in the dynamic facilitation process or in choice creating is people put down their walls of denial and they're authentic. They become authentic. And how we do that, one of the ways we do it is when we ask somebody what the answer is, you know, what, what's your solution? And then they'll give us something usually that's just kind of like the wind or, you know, better communication or some, some, something that everybody with motherhood, you know. And, and you, you say, well, how would you do motherhood? What would it look like? And so we just drive it down and drive it down until they're saying what they, 
they're saying their best answer that they know and they normally would get stomped on, but they're not getting stomped on. And now other people are starting to say their answers. And everybody just moves to a new level of authenticity. And as soon as you start dropping those walls and speaking with authentic, authentically to one another, you start to see more and more of what's really happening. And, you, and, and so the, the problem solving and the thinking of the group moves to a much higher level. And then when you pronounce, when you pronounce what you've come up with to the larger community, you do two things. You pronounce what you came up with and you tell the story of how you got there. And the story seems to carry the message to the larger community. They, they then feel more of a participant in this process. All of this we're finding by trial and error. Yeah. Uh, well, you said you just used the phrase fortress of denial, and I would say that your model of working within a system that many of us don't think is effective for what we think reality of human life is, is a better way of phrasing it than fortress of denial. Many people I know don't deny these things. But um, aside from that, the there seems to be a magic number of 12 or 13. Is that because of it's a workable number for for the facilitator to work with? Yeah, um, uh, let me just say something about the denial thing, and too. Um, and then the, how we got to 12 uh, is, I, I wrote my book about 24. I suggested 24, because I was the largest small group I could think of. And what we've discovered is it doesn't matter really how big the group is. It's really, the smaller is better because the group can make more progress. And it, and it seems to work just as well. So over that, we got that by practice. But the thing about denial is that, I mean, all of us are in denial. Even those of us who see the issue of, of what we're doing to the planet and so forth, often are in a place of holding onto a solution that can't really work and just carrying on with it. Or uh, I was really interested to hear where where she was going to go with Derek Jensen. You know, uh, she mentioned Derek Jensen a little <clears throat> last night, and I was wondering what because I've talked to him, and he, I mean, I think he's in denial about. He just thinks, well, if the world's going to fall apart, we just can't wait till it happens, and then everything's going to get better. I mean, I'm sorry, that's not a good answer. And yet, I, because you know, it, it's like he sees, he sees the problem really, really well. But to hold on to that solution is. Yes. I think, like, in relation to uh, conservative uh, communities, I mean, there is some common ground where some of their, you know, some of the platforms that, you know, you know conservatives, Republicans, at least say they believe in, um, you know, aren't that bad of being fiscally conservative, being for individual freedom of defending America. And I think helping them to actually, you know, if you can actually find people that really believe those platforms, and it's not just something they say, but it's something they truly believe in, then there is, you know, common ground, you know, they're looking at different ways of defending America could be, you know, you know, have, you know, that we actually have a clean environment, that's one way of, you know, defending the country is to the country. Um, so looking at some other platforms, finding people that actually believe in them rather than just giving them lip service, um, and, you know, I think, you know, some common ground can be found there. Yes, I, I, I would say one of the things I've noticed in the, about the really cons the conservative people when they speak is that a lot of their position comes from the fact that they feel it's not possible. Like, um, I remember in one session we had somebody say, the capitalism is the only system that works. Okay? It's the only system that can work. Well, I wrote that down on the concern chart. <laughs> In other words, you're concerned that capitalism is the only system that will work. And, and that's really where they're coming from. It's like they, they've given up and they don't want to they don't want to go to that place of being powerless, so they just they'd be this powerful. I don't mean the they, but I mean all of us are have grabbed something to hold on to. And uh, and, and um, I, I just feel like there's this sense of one of the characteristics, I think, of people, when you're creative, you're uh -huh. And a lot of us have been to that creative place and been in that zone, 
and we got slammed. And we said, never again. Not going there anymore. Thank you very much. And then you have to build the whole a whole structure around that new place of not going to that to be become vulnerable. Yes. yes. You talked about the fortress of denial. Yeah. Uh, why I think a lot of that is the fortress of fear because all of us are self controlled whether it's the Mexicans on TV or the terrorists or the whatever. And um, you really shrink inside when you let yourself go there. So how to open or go beyond or go around the yes. fear seems crucial. Yeah. She's talking about the, the going beyond the fear. I, I was telling, I think it was maybe Lily this morning. Um, on May 9th, 1993, I exploded out of a chair and I saw how this could work. <laughs> I mean, it was just, I, I got on an airplane and flew to Washington, D.C. I thought they would say, thanks, Jim, we'll work on it from here. I got confused about the difference between we the culture and we the people. Could you yeah. go into that a little bit? Well, I, I, I realized realize that the culture, I mean, there's a lot of, this is the last one I added, that there's a lot of people that think that there, we can reach critical mass and that will make the difference. Or that we can, uh, that if once all of us, the purchasers of stock and the Fire, all of us change our culture, then then that then will be <coughs> sustainable. I don't think so. I think what people ignore is that we have anchored in place a machine, a mechanistic system, and we've put it in charge of us. And we can create the circle inside the box so big that it almost fills the whole box, but it's still a box. So culture, system, society are all in that definition of we. Right. Yeah. Okay. The key is how do we get a circle outside of the box that contains the box? Right. And that, that shift requires a trigger. The Wisdom Council offers that. It can make, it can make a legitimate, a, a we the people with agency. And then all these tremendous tools that are all around, like future search, open space, Appreciative inquiry. You know, you need all these great tools now can be applied to serve not the old system, but just to, you know, because right now, as long as they're being applied within the system, they're just extending the life of the system. They're just extending it. They're making us more comfortable, given it's all tried, it's all tanked anyway. So how do we? I forgot the code word for that. So what the key is, they're tremendous skills and capabilities, but as soon as we have a way of people, then those can be uh, applied to, uh, the new, to the new paradigm. Making decisions, there are people making decisions. Yeah. That are Through. But no, now when the referee's there, we're wearing uniforms, 
referee's got the stripes on. Now I go right up to the edge of the line, and anything, and I might even try and cheat a little bit and tell them that I made it. And I might elbow somebody to get a better position. It's a game. That's what we do in a game. Now, if somebody gets hurt, or actually I have a life outside the game, there's moments like, oh, we're not playing this game anymore. Now I'm worried this person got hurt. I'm, I'm a different me. What we did, there was a we, a living we, I believe, in 200 some years ago, that set up the game. You and I were born into it. We, we've forgotten that there's real life. We think, yes, of course we have self-interest, but more primarily, more primarily, we like to serve life. We want to serve life. I mean, every high school kid I know wants to serve humanity and life and whatever and, and, and be recognized for it. And, and yet we say, no, 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 you have to learn the system here. <laughs> and so there's a, to me it's about waking up out of the game, out of this fishbowl that we've been born into, as, as, and, and taking agency for, our, for the lives of birth. It's all of that. And a corporation, of course, is a, is a function of the system. It's been created by the system to be what the system needs, which is that self-interested entity. And then you and I are, I, I have to, I don't know about you, but I have, in order to get paid, I pretty much have to serve that entity. That's right. as, even as an independent consultant. And I notice woodworkers in poor towns, and they're all, they all, you know, would love to build that perfect little crafted railing or something in a beautiful home because that then their art form gets they're doing the same thing. They think they're independent of it. No, they're doing it too. So how how do how do we as a collective group of people figure out what we want and help one another get it? Different system. And and, and I think that if the if that you know the founders of our to the political system assumed that people were self-interested. And then they designed the system to deal with it. And what they did is they made a self-fulfilling prophecy. They created these you know, corporate entities and, and that's, that's the way I see it. Yeah, well, by the way, yeah. And they didn't expect us to stay with it. They thought there'd be these ongoing constitutional conventions that would just keep happening. They didn't, never expected that this was it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. So the model you created is uh, very compelling, and I thank you for sharing this with us today. Um, the examples you're giving about specific communities, like I think you said Pleasant Hill, New York, um, aren't they just helping to make the system run better? I, I'm missing the kind of transformative piece of. Is there more that goes on inside those conversations um, that gives people a sense of, of greater possibility, but you, know, you can't act on that immediately, but we do have that sense now. We do have a, a greater sense of power for ourselves. Well, you're, you're right. We haven't done a we the people yet. We don't have that. I, I talked about three we's. The we as individuals, we can show that we've made a lot of an impact on individuals. And, and we politically, I've got a couple examples of how political change has happened. And we as a culture, like in the Department of Agriculture, they, they've really changed their whole culture to one of trust. So I can point to some examples of the three weeds. It's the fourth weed that's the question. It's still a theory. Can, can we really create this weed of people? And we've had indicators that say yes, but I can't point to the examples of the transformation that I would expect to see with the weed, with the weed of people. Oh, an indicator of the way the people. Well, in the, I, I mean, in the when well, we did one for a farm credit, bank, and the farm credit, it was actually a farm credit banks. <coughs> there were two banks, one management system, two boards of directors, and the boards of directors couldn't get along and they split up. But we were in the middle of a wisdom council, and the employees were now. They, they didn't have management. All of a sudden, they were just a group of people, a community of people, trying to make things right for everybody. And it was beautiful to watch, and they were having brown bag lunches, and they were, the president was involved. Everybody, everybody was just a community of people trying to figure out, 
okay, we're going to split up. We're not going to be an organization anymore. Um, how do we do this as a collective group? Because nobody's got the job anymore. So how do we do this? And it was, it was just a beautiful moment to see that sense of, my gosh, they're doing it around the Wisdom Council. That's what's making this happen. Um, so uh, that was one indicator. I, I can't think of it right now, but there were some others that um, felt exciting to me. The, um, my book, uh, you know, has been out for five years or something. Just recently got reviewed by the Amazon.com number one fiction reviewer, number one nonfiction reviewer. <laughs> <laughs> He said, and I quote, um, this book is certainly one of the hundred, probably one of the 25, possibly one of the 10 most important books available in English. Wow. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your attention.